I'm going to talk though about the credence of neurodevelopment, one of my favorite topics, pharyngeal morphology, and myofunctional health and infancy. How many of you are excited about hearing this? <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I was already introduced. I'm an OT. I do medical therapy. I'm in private practice in Cincinnati. I was at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center for 17 and a half years. Is this not working? Well, not good. I might start walking around too, you never know. <laughs> but I've been in private practice now for four years, and I feel like I've grown a lot in that time. Uh, one, because I'm out from the auspices of a hospital where I had responsibility as an occupational therapist to say certain things and to hold certain truths, and I found myself now kind of unhinged out here <laughs> in private practice, and I really like that. I also work in a pediatric dentist office as a phrenectomy assistant, a body worker, and an OT person. So we work in a multidisciplinary collaborative effort for all of our phrenectomies. I actually was just scanning through my slides and realized I don't have one picture of tongue tie in here. I don't have the words tethered oral tissues in here. I'm kind of relieved and actually grateful to not have that so much be the emphasis. It's going to be a huge part of myofunctional therapy disorders. But that's not the topic what I'm talking about today. So let's move forward. The disclosures is I am on the faculty of AOMT, and I'm very proud of that. I'm the tummy time method developer, and also I work at Tufts as a visiting faculty teaching infant phrenectomies there. All right, so infancy, most of you are used to hearing me talking about pre-crawling babies, and that doesn't include all of infancy. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about that, and that's basically the first year of life. This is going to include pre-crawling and crawling and also pulling to stand, even making some sideways steps, because you know we start to learn to walk first to the side. It's not forward or backward, but it's to the side. So in this infancy period, this is a critical period not only for, I'm going to take a chance if that's the It's not only a critical period for neuroplasticity. I think we're all used to that, what neuroplasticity is, the amazing changes that the brain can make. And actually, it's not limited to infancy. This is just a huge critical period and window. We have even Peter Hottenhofer, one of my favorite doctors, has even, he's now since passed, documented synaptic development in a 91-year-old man. So we continue to have neuroplastic premise, and that's how our brain works. But this is a critical period. It's also a critical period for movement exploration. Baby's movement is a little bit different than even older children and adult movement. It's a huge time for attachment and bonding and connection, the social between us, and also how we're developing our autonomic nervous system regulation and our resiliency. So the regulation is that part of like, how do we shift between autonomic states? Can we do that well? Can we rise to the occasion of the activity that needs to be done? Can we bounce back from challenges, threats, and the environment? And in infancy, there's a huge need for co-regulation. And what that means is that we use other people and our relationships to help us regulate our own nervous system. And it's true for all of us, actually, as mammals. That's how we um, co-regulate. Self-regulation are things we do for short periods of time. And we can do it, but then we run and download that with someone we talk to someone or connect with someone about after we've done something that we've had to um, have self-regulation over. And in this period of time, babies go from these basic survival instincts, using ingestive vagal reflexes for primary autonomic regulation, to using prosocial engagement in cortical processes for autonomic regulation. So that's a huge change. Let's just for a minute just imagine that. You go from just sucking and swallowing and making you feel good and safe and okay, to using cortical and relationship processes in order to regulate. But this is one of the problems with myofunctional health is that we see children, infants, unable to co-regulate or use those mechanisms. They have persistent oral habits and they use persistent ingestive vagal reflexes for their regulation. So we know that's now an immaturity problem. So we're gonna to try to marry these three topics today, neural development, myofunctional health, and pharyngeal morphology. So as it's relating to infant neural development, there's going to be some categories. Oral function is going to be one of the biggest ones. Babies have their best function or should have their best function, development, movement in their mouth, their tongue, their jaw, their lips, their cheeks, their neck even. That should be the area, because we're cephalocaudal developers, that is more highly developed. 
Posture comes on really quick too because we get head control by when. When do we really want babies to have head control? Eight weeks. It's pretty early. And forming connections, also going through sensory processing, which also includes reflexes. The way we use reflexes and the way reflexes are also integrated, but how we take in all of the senses and integrate them and use them for purposeful movement or not. And this movement part, where babies have spontaneous movements, they have reflexes, and they also have active volitional movements. So yes, babies have active volitional movements. I'll pick up on this a little bit later, but they've even looked in the womb, and babies have active volitional movements in the womb. It's not that much. It's a very small part of the movement repertoire, but it's true, because they looked at when and multiples were in, and they looked at reaching velocities. They noticed that they would slow down the reaching when they would reach for the twin's face. Otherwise, it was just you know, kind of all erratic and all over. Or when they're going to touch themselves, there's a slow guided process. And you see it early on in early infancy, active volitional movements. Now, a majority of the movements are spontaneous and reflexive, but there are active volitional movements happening. And also then, developmental progression and play, because play is the playground for learning. So with oral function, optimally, for optimal oral uh, functional health, it would be breastfeeding. And you know that there are definite um, other things we can do and other things that we need to do to meet the feeding goals. But for the most part, and I wouldn't say these are the best latches in the world either, because the babies I work with are compromised. But this is not bad, right? You can see this? Maybe even a little bit overly flanged. But this is going to be a big one because babies should have their latch established by three to four weeks this across the board. If it's not, that's out of the norm. Those first early weeks, there are some flustering and fumbling about that can happen, but we really should have solid feeding set by three to four weeks. Other things are posture, and this is where we start to get into asymmetries. It has to do with muscle tone and cranial nerve function and strength, but there are asymmetries both in the anterior posterior plane, in the lateral, and also a combination or torsion, which is a rotation. Kind of pattern. And I'm not allowed to make any kind of diagnosis, but I feel all day long what I would say is scoliotic feeling is fine. I'm allowed to say that. And I see that a lot, and many people report later with myofunctional disorders a lot of scoliosis correlated there. And if you have scoliosis as an adult, you've had it as a baby. All right, so the social nervous system is going to mainly comprise five cranial nerves. It's 5, 7, 9, 10, and 11, so it's trigeminal, facial, glossopharyngeal, vagus, and accessory. We're going to get into it a little bit, not a lot. But it's all the cranial nerves combined, actually. You can't separate it out. But in the brain, there is a special overlap and connection amongst those five that make them even tighter of a group. And it comprises the um, majority of face, mouth, cranium, shoulder movements, too. The way we use our cranial nerves, because we are cephalocaudal developers, meaning our head and neck is going to develop and be the most mature, most exciting, most sophisticated, and it goes down the body. This is a picture of the social nervous system, so it's our muscles of facial expression, our muscles of head and neck orientation, of sucking and jaw mobility, our laryngeal muscles, which is why how our voice sounds is an indication of our autonomic regulation. Our vocal prosody reveals the underlying autonomic process that's happening. This is what we're really talking about. What is the social nervous system is this, looking at each other, gazing together, cooing back and forth. And it is usually between a parent and a child, but it could be between siblings and even other mammals. In tummy time, we find that the animals in the house love to come around and they'll circle around and they'll get down there with them and they'll be there supporting. And that's a great support for the nervous system because we're going to tune into that part that's not cognitive necessarily. It's a feeling part of us. Orienting to the caregiver, which is a really big one because how many of you are working with babies and you notice babies have a head turning preference to one side? Yeah. Almost all babies do right away after birth because we have two sides and something to compare it to. And we've been in a closed container. But within, again, a few days to weeks, three at the most, those head turning preferences to clear up. 
So we know that our social nervous system has very strong reflexes, meaning I have to do it. If you put the sensory input in, I have to respond. That's how reflexes are. But they do need the sensory input to happen. And this is where so much of the degradation of mild functional health is happening. It's the fact that they're not doing the things that promote optimal health, tone, strength, and range of motion. And that gets worse and worse over time. And we see if you can't turn your head to the caregiver, then that is an issue of orienting to the caregiver. It's not just head turning preference. This goes much deeper than the alignment or the structure or the checking the developmental <coughs> box, but you turn your head both sides. And the other part of this is that it's bi-directional and reciprocal, which means that who's benefiting here? Both. And so it has to happen in this back and forth exchange. And that's what feeds and soothes and oils our nervous system so that we can feel safe enough to take a risk to do something new and so that we can really feel those good feelings. That's a big problem in our society is just really feeling the good feelings. And we're almost afraid of them and anxiety because it stirs up a lot of things. This is really important for babies because they're getting used to their GI sensations, which is new in the womb. Yes, they were definitely continuously fed. They were you know, creating their microbiome and collecting meconium, but they were not assimilating food across the bowel wall, and they weren't passing anything through, hopefully, because when they do, we know that's a sign of stress. This is a part of what infant cognition is. So the social nervous system, smiling at each other, cooing at each other, Having eye gaze, these are fun and interesting and feel good, but they're also super important for brain development. They're, this is the smarts of the baby. This is infant cognition, and you can actually relate cognition to ability to engage in social nervous system, the, ro the robustness of, the, of the, what they're able to do with it. And we have, you know, this is me, you know, treating a baby too, so it doesn't have to be the parent as well. As soon as baby gets some regulation of the social nervous system, you can transfer that to other people, and that can be really good for, for babies. So the developmental progression is going to happen as the baby moves, connects, feels safe, enough to take a risk to do something new. So what does our nervous system need to feel safe? It needs the social engagement. It needs the eye gaze, the social engagement. We need facial expressions to give feedback into our brain to help us feel the good feelings. And what do you feel like just looking at these pictures? Doesn't that, do you feel it in your gut and your sense of ease? This transfers out to all of us because we're working on the same vibe for autonomic nervous system. But when it's not, we see this, cranial nerve dysfunction, where the face is offline, the eyes are non-directed, the tongue is not engaged. Look how thick the tongue is. There's not any engagement, the muscle tone and the strength. The thick tongue is usually not a size problem as much as it is hasn't, the muscles aren't working enough, so they're just, it's more endorphins, they're bigger. We see this, would you call this head control? This is a nine-week-old baby. No, but it's getting passed off as head control. But this is not head control. 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 This is head control. And head control kind of looks bodily. You know, it's one of these things because the head is heavy. And you're actually using active co-contraction to keep the head up, not tension or stiffness or tongue humping or bunching. But why are babies doing that? Because they're trying to keep their airway open, which a lot of it has to do with the pharynx. So we see more dysfunction here, and this over time will lead to even less contraction and neural feedback loops between these sets of lips. You get, you see, this is the orbicularis oris muscle going all the way around the mouth. You can see that it's not actively engaged, and so the pressure or the force is coming up. What's that going to do to the palate? Yeah, it's just going to continue to contribute to the high arch palate or the bubble palate, etc. But if the lips are sealed down, it pulls down here and helps to widen the structure. Another thing about social nervous system is our best palate expansion activity for babies is smiling. So let's all do that. 
Everybody smile real big. Do you feel the pull of the muscles across the maxilla? And you'll notice that a lot of these babies with mild functional disorders smile like this. The jaw comes open. Instead of where you're really using also the trigeminal muscles and all of the facial muscles. There's just some more of this. And it is really passed off as super cute. And we have the eye for it. The public doesn't yet. So as much as we can do for education, that would be great. Because we see the potential problems here, and we see the current problems. Because these babies are having trouble with nursing, turning their head, being comfortable, passing gaps, pooping, burping. Too many shenanigans going on. So the pharyngeal shaping, okay, the, the form, the shape, the size, the dimension of the pharynx is going to be dependent on a lot of things. One of them is going to be cranial shape. How many of you are seeing babies with really odd cranial shapes? There's the obvious one, which is plagiocephaly, one side's flat, one side bulgy. There's brachycephaly, where the back of the head is flat. There's scaphocephaly, where the head is narrow. And then there's random head molding, where that doming look, or just any kind of Anything that looks out of sorts or asymmetrical is going to be ha probably having a problem with head molding. And the shape of the skull is going to have an influence on the pharynx because of the attachments. So the amount of pressure and force and movement that's generated through active movement is going to shape these things. So I'm going to try to ask us not to like blame structure for why stuff isn't working and look at structure as an indication of what function isn't working. All right, so what is the pharynx anyway? It's the throat, it's a food channel, it's part of the upper airway, we use it for vocalization. It's a membrane-lined body cavity. It connects the outside world with the inside world, okay, going down to the digestive tract and into the lungs. It's a drainage area. Okay, our eustachian tube is going to drain into our throat. And we're supposed to be pressurizing our eustachian tubes every single time we swallow. And there are so many babies that aren't doing this and have issues with that down the road. It's part of our immune system, the tonsils and adenoids. And it also connects the middle ear and assists eustachian tube function, which I mentioned already. There's three parts to it. There's the upper, middle, and lower. The upper is going to include the nasal pharynx, the Middle is the oral pharynx, and the lower is the hypopharynx and the laryngopharynx. The boundaries, which I think are really interesting, is the back is the posterior cervical vertebrae, the lateral are, is soft tissue, the in, um, anterior is the nasal cavity, the soft palate, and the epiglottis and larynx. So the pharynx is kind of a U-shaped structure like this that's attached along this front line. So the front of it is going to be the back of the tongue and the soft palate. And the bottom part of it is the larynx, other soft tissue, the upper esophageal sphincter, which is going to be part of the issue with reflux. That's supposed to be tonically contracted until we swallow. okay? And then it relax a little bit to allow air to come up. And that's why babies have reflux. They go to burp, and then that doesn't close, and it brings up a whole host of things. So just thinking about the boundaries, we'll also think about what nerves innervate the pharynx themselves. And actually three of our cranial nerves come together to form the pharyngeal plexus. And that's the vagus nerve, which we heard a lot about yesterday if you were here, glossopharyngeal nerve, and the accessory. The accessory is really important for our sternocleidomastoid and our traps, which is the orientation or turning our head. But interesting thing, there's a lot of interesting things about the accessory nerve. It also sends a contributory down with the vagus nerve and the glossopharyngeal to help the motor components, okay, in the pharynx. The vagus nerve, just as a quick review, is our 10th cranial nerve. It's both efferent and afferent. And afferent means that it's listening, okay, it's sensory input. So it's about 80% of its function is afferent, listening to our guts, our viscera, our insides, and sending information out. That's a huge, big part of the vagus nerve because it's going to go in and be the primary player in our autonomic nervous system regulation. Then there's the vagus efferent, 
which is about 20% of its function. So about 15 to 17% of its function is down regulatory parasympathetic, and then a very small 3 to 5% is actually efferent muscle to the special visceral efferents. So the pharynx, larynx, soft palate, and platoglossus muscle. It's going to be really important, all right, for the bidirectional reciprocal engagement because what the vagus does is it acts as a brake and it slows down our heart rate and slows down our respiratory rate so that we can feel calm and safe enough to do the next thing. If we're up here in sympathetic overdrive, that's not the place to try to do something new necessarily, especially for a vulnerable baby. The vagus nerve has vast implications in our GI function and our airway too. Now the glossopharyngeal is mostly, it does innervate one muscle, okay, but most of the glossopharyngeal function is sensory. So it's going to be helping retrieve sensory input primarily from the pharynx and sending that information to the rest of the cranial nerve and even parts of the cortex about what's happening with the airflow, what's happening with the muscle tone, what's happening with the structures around it, sending information up. And if it doesn't get the information that it needs, it's sending subpar feelings. And this is what happens because it's like a never-ending process of catch-22. Until we can get more optimal movement in there, more optimal sensory input, it's going to go on the way it is because that's how our brains do. We get better at what we practice and we actually get worse at what we don't do. Which has vast implications for everything. Okay, so again about the pharynx, it has two muscular layers, the outside and the inside. And the outside constricts and squeezes, that's really important for clearing. And the other one elongates and widens, and shortens, that kind of thing. So the mobility should be three-dimensional and quite moving. There's a little picture of this. And this is a little bit of an elongated picture for a baby and an infant. These would be a lot closer. But just so that you know, there's these attachments of the pharynx are to the skull, the maxilla, the jaw, these cartilages here. What's this thing? The hyoid bone. So for those of you who are feeling really sorry for the highway bone feeling like floating out there in space. It's not, in fact, floating out there in space, subject to all the nothing. It's securely adhered by this intense connective tissue and the thyroid cartilage. So the hyoid and the thyroid cartilage really are together. You don't, highway's not out there sailing, free-flowing out there in the muscles. I often hear lectures and I, it makes me want to feel sorry for the highway until I realize that it's securely attached by this really intense connective tissue membrane all the way to the thyroid cartilage. We need to take all of that into consideration. But here we've got, down here, to the cricoid cartilage. And what's this structure in pink, right behind the trachea? The esophagus, because the esophagus and the trachea share a common wall until it bifurcates into the bone, right? So that's an interesting, and this is a posterior view. And this is the occiput. So we've got the posterior, the uh, pharyngeal tubercle, of the occiput is where the pharynx is going to secure itself. <laughs> then it's going to throw up some attachments to the temporal bones and all those structures you saw in front. Which I think is really interesting that the whole pharynx is going to hang on the occiput. So everybody touch the back head bone, that's your occiput. And so then underneath it, you've got your foramen magnum, which is where your what's coming out, your spinal cord. And then right in front of that is where your pharynx is going. So all these plagiocephaly and brachycephaly and scaphocephaly and random head molding, the shape of the head is going to dictate the muscular connections, how the sensory input is coming through. So we're going to look at head shape as an indicator for function or not and muscle function or not. Not that, oh, this head shape is causing this problem. We look at the structure to give us information about what the function did not do because it's movement and development that drive the whole system. Another really important little guy is the genioglossus muscle. We know this little person as a extrinsic tongue muscle, right? It becomes extremely important in the air uh, volume for the pharynx because the genioglossus is going to be in good for it, and stabilizing and enlarging the pharynx itself. Now, this is going to take a lot more into consideration because the size and shape of the jaw is going to matter. 
the size and shape of the palate is going to matter, the tongue function, how bunched, humpy, retracted, tetheral tissues, etc. that it is. So the genial glasses, let's all palpate ours, sort of, we kind of get underneath here, starts, and it's, it's um, on both sides too, on the inside of the mandible, and then it happens to go up, and then from this bony attachment, insert itself into the soft body of the tongue, which is not just one muscle, but four. And if we did a dissection on all of our tongues in here, they would all look a little different. That's how variable anatomy is. Some of us, depending upon our fetal movements and what happened in gestation is when these all get set up. The size and shape of your jaw, the floor of your mouth, it's obviously influenced by genetics and other things as well, but heavily influenced by the movement. We need genioglossus to really work. And what other motion do we know the genioglossus to help with? Tongue extension. It's your tongue extender. It's the airway protective muscle. It's the one that does that. So some people used to say, well, you don't have tethered tissues if you can stick your tongue out. For some babies, that's an indication that they do because it's overusing genioglossus to get a bigger airway. And actually, it's quite, I like when a baby shows up with it, I'm like, smart. I still have to fix, you know, where the tongue goes and like work with the alignment and stuff, but that's a smart strategy. Sometimes better than the babies whose tongues are really far back because they can't get the widening into the pharynx itself. So this is going to be really fun because this is fun to do. Who doesn't do this with babies? <laughs> Just get a little bit more movement in there. These little facial massage, and touch, and connection that's happening during social engagement can be enough to make a big difference and get the airway volume bigger. Because one of my favorite PTs, Mary Mastery, if you're not familiar with her, look her up. She says, if you can't breathe, you can't function. And if that's not true, I don't know what is. And so breathing is going to be the number one thing. I spent nine years working in the NICU, and the funny rule was, a, B, C. It wasn't funny at all. It was true. It's airway, right? That's the number one thing. And it's the truth of us for our functioning as well. All right, something else that happens over the infancy period is that we're born with a big head and a very short neck. And pharyngeal elongation, neck elongation, is one of the critical, essential pieces of postural development, also important for our whole mechanism, our oral, oral facial mechanism. And you should start to see this elongation happening around three months, but this is also when we often see swallowing dysfunction get really, really wild. Because now we're not protected by the close proximity of the structures of the infant swallow, the newborn swallow. We now have a little bit more room for error. We need more coordination. We need more inner and outer <coughs> pharyngeal muscles squeezing and moving, and we need good alignment for this to happen. And then by one, you should see this. So, Part of a good infant malfunctional health assessment is going to look at neck elongation. And that's what we're doing at AOMT. Another thing is head and neck movements. And this is a big problem with babies, but now we know that they have orientation, reflexes. It's not just about turning your head. This is part of a whole collaborative social nervous system event. And we also want nasal breathing, which is going to be repeated hopefully a few more times over the weekend. We need good postural tone, strength, and movement. We need optimal hard and soft palate shapes and movement. We need good tongue function, and we need an optimal jaw size and position. Working on head and neck movements can be very powerful because we also <coughs> need you to know that the incidence currently of plagiocephaly is 46.9%, 46.9%. And so that's about half of all babies are affected by head molding, and it's underdiagnosed. And remember we said that the head molding is not necessarily the problem itself, it's an indication of the movement disorder, and it indicates that things aren't working properly in the tongue, lips, cheek, and jaw area, and it's probably affecting, at least by even these standards, half of all babies. All right, so we need to talk just for a second about this palate shape and size. There's all kinds. There's this high palate, and this is where it kind of goes all the way back to the soft palate. This is about the same size. This is a bubble palate. These are not easy to photograph, where it's higher in the front, and then it drops down rapidly in the back. And the reason why it drops down is because, you know, tongue to the palate is a normal, natural <coughs> occurrence. 
but not all babies can do that because of the mid to posterior tongue restriction, but the tongue sometimes, the front of the tongue, the blade of the tongue can go up. And so that's where all the movement and doming happens, instead of the whole palate getting spread wide. And also because our palate is not just our maxilla, it's also the palatine bones, which is actually named after the palatine's palate. And these are they're tall columnar bones that are just on the back of our palate that go up and articulate with our sphenoid bone. Okay, and our sphenoid and our occiput come together. That's the primary movement in osteopathy and craniosacral therapy, and where the movement is really generated from the bottom of the skull. But this is going to affect not only since the boundaries of the pharynx in the front of it are the soft palate and the tongue, these shape and size are going to matter. If you're, you know, palate is also in this position, what, do you, what can you also say about this baby and its tongue? What's one assumption by looking at this picture that you could say for sure? Yeah, there's no tongue match here. Look at that. Is that tongue going to fit up there? Has that tongue ever looked like it's fit up there at all? No. But it will shape and mold around this tongue because it's muscular hydrostatic. And over time, with lip seal and elevated tongue and good jaw function, this will change. So sometimes we have to do things to be able to get that to happen. But for the most part, that's what I'd like to say about it. So the jaw shape and size are also going to affect it. Imagine, if you will, that your jaw is either retracted or small. Just push back on yours a little bit and see the effect. It's kind of hard for us because guess what? Babies aren't little adults. Okay? They're just not. They're their own creature. They have a completely different movement repertoire. They're in the now, in the here, in the moment. They're not thinking in that way. They're experiencing themselves. Okay, but look at this. <coughs> I mean, that's an insane thing. This is what it looks like in utero. Okay, so we knew that already. And this is what it looks like now. Well, when he was born. I should have put that one on the legs like right now because it looks amazing. Actually, if you want to look at that, come and see me later. That would be a good reason to come talk to me. But this is going to make a difference in how big the air volume is in the pharynx and also how where the tongue can be. There's not a lot of options with this. All right. So the tongue itself has a lot of movements. We need elevation, extension, lateralization, central grooving. We need that wave-like peristaltic motion. And that, combined with the seals, is going to be able to generate pressure, intraoral pressure, that creates a vacuum. And milk follows the vacuum. Many of these babies, even if they, we work on their tongue function, and we don't maximize their seals, they can't generate the suction component. So their milk transfer is very low. And also, we need them to be able to tongue, tongue suction hold. So let's all try that. Put your tongues up the front, middle, and back of your tongue, all the way up to your hard palate, and drop your jaw a little bit. <coughs> Practice that. Because if we're in the field of myofunctional therapy health, we need to be able to do all these exercises ourselves. And I'm tied, so I have to really work at it. But still be able to do the tongue suction hold really good. It's important. So this is an example because not very many people get to see a baby elevating their tongue. And I've always asked that. Do you have a picture of a baby elevating their tongue? Now, what do we notice though, maybe? Yeah, there's a, it's like, look at this. And then it's real fleshy and meaty. But look, that's some good elevation though, okay? But we are noticing the jaw is not exactly wide enough open. And look how thick the tongue is, but that's a really good picture. Here's another one. This is pre phrenectomy as well. This is post phrenectomy. But you can tell there can be still a lot of elevation. It can happen. But you have to know how. And if you don't, come learn from me or somebody else who knows how to elicit the tongue movements that really need to happen. And guess what? In my office, we can have it do it, but it's not really that important to happen in my office. Where is it important that it happens? At home, every day, all day long. Because that's one of the principles of neuroplasticity is you can't just, it's not one and done. It has to have repetition and consistency and saliency and transference and all these different elements that doing one treatment doesn't fit. So you're going to see that a lot of infant myofunctional health is going to be parent education, preschool and teacher education, daycare education. This is really important for us to know. So creating and maintaining those seals is going to be really important for creating this pressure 
And that is really our body loves pressure and force because that's how it knows how to grow. And we want that to be optimal. And we know that you have to do the thing to get to the next higher level. You have to engage in the activity and do it before the next level is going to really happen. So the anterior seals are really the top lip and the tongue. So the bottom lip is a secondary seal. But what you'll, you see a lot is the baby's trying to... It's the baby's with lip blisters. They're trying to hang on to the breast with their lips because the tongue is not. That could be the jaw shape and the size. It could be the palate shape and the size. It could be the pharynx that has a very small air on and it can barely breathe anyway. The posterior seals are made by the soft palate and the tongue. The soft palate and the tongue back there, they're having a good relationship. And the two of them, they send signals back and forth unless they're not touching properly. And then it's really hard for them. And then we get uncoordinated swallows, etc. So mild functional health at infancy is going to be around these issues, optimal oral rest posture, nasal breathing, oral facial strength and movement, jaw stability and mobility, and tongue movements. We want to see a variety and a complexity in the movements that are astounding. I'm amazed every time I see variability and complexity in tongue movements because most of the time when I see in my offices, <laughs> it's like, let's get this plane off the ground, right? We got to get the tongue up and going, and when the tongue, when we cry, the tongue should look sort of like a stingray in there, giving you a real show. <laughs> and if it's not, there's something else going on. So there's three parts to the oral rest posture. It's going to be the jaw gently closed. I first presented this in March at the AMS meeting a couple of years ago. Two, the tongue fully secure to the palate. That means not the tip. That doesn't mean the, the spot is the thing for babies. It's all the way up, every single part of it, and the lips are sealed in a soft, straight line. And here's some examples of some suboptimal tongue postures. These are tricky because you peek in there and you can see the front of the tongue's open. You're like, yeah, I got this. But it's not the full story. That could be a good progression towards something else, but that's not the whole story. You want to get the jaw maximally open as much as possible and have balanced tension and the tongue staying at the top. This one's more of an easy one to understand. And you can imagine if the tongue's not pressing up here on the palate, you're not going to get the width. You're not going to get the expansion vertical. Or you don't want vertical. You want this way and this way. You're not going to get that expansion if the tongue itself is not up there. And guess what? Infant mild health is not about preventing OMDs. Everybody. <laughs> it is not about preventing. These are present already. The OMDs, the oral mouth functional disorders, are already there. Do you see this? Downturn corners of the mouth, open mouth posture, tinted upper lip, jaw asymmetry, decreased muscle tone. This is not about preventing anything. It's about noticing it earlier, having the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the hands to know what to do. Optimal oral rest posture, though, is going to take a collaboration of all these cranial nerves. So it's not that simple either. Because we're also talking about, I mentioned earlier, sensory processing and reflex integration and the maturation of the movement repertoire. All of this is happening. And that's the other thing about infancy that's so interesting is it's never the same. If I see someone at six weeks and then I see them in eight weeks, this is two weeks gone by. And the developmental expectations continue to stack up. And what happens is there's an inverse relationship. They're not going up. They're going down because the expectations are going higher and they're not meeting, they're not completing those up right before. So it's a collaboration, not just one thing. This on the left is going to be suboptimal, even though what? What can you spy with your little eye? Okay, the tongue is up, but it's going to be one of those suboptimal tongue postures where it's really up at the front. We're happy, okay? I'm not disappointed. But, so this is not quite yet mouth breathing, but all open mouth postures will lead to mouth breathing. So babies are mouth breathing, but this one is not. But this is really where we're going, okay? Tongue up, lip seal. This is not perfect. You see a little asymmetry. We're working with babies. What also do you see here that I said? Lots and lots of those. You really want to go from nasal breathing, though. Okay. When these lips are together, there's a feedback loop between this whole orbicularis oris about how to pull down forces and the pressure for spreading the palate, opening up the mid-face, growing your face. Kevin Boyd calls it the cranial facial respiratory complex. 
and just for Kevin's sake, since he's not here, is he here? Let's all say it. Craniofacial respiratory complex. If you don't know Kevin, look him up. But this is suboptimal and it degrades monofunctional health. This is suboptimal and the outcome at 10 months compromised monofunctional health. This is what we're looking for, people. Not just when they're awake, but when they're sleeping. This is a big part of it. We need the jaw gently closed, the tongue fully elevated, and the lips sealed. And even this baby can rock it, okay? This mom worked hard for this, and you know because you can see this. But over time, this will change things enormously and have an impact that we really can't measure right now. But I think we all, and who we are in the pioneers, we can anticipate what that is, and we can hope for them to have really good health. So these things, this associated affect, the lip blusters, the two-tone lips, open mouth posture, and low tongue, is they're checking out of all of those things that babies are rich in, the baby smarts, the baby cognition. So it's not just cute doing social nervous system things, it's powerful malfunctional therapy help because it happens over time. You get cranial molding, facial asymmetry, um, all kinds of things going on with the eyes because if the tongue's not pressing up on the mid-face, that does have an impact on the eye and how the eyeballs move around. <coughs> in the skull, and this is not about waiting for this person to have problems, it's already going on. There's a really great technique that I'm going to leave you with, and it's on my YouTube channel if you want to check it out, Michelle Emanuel. It's a sleeping tongue posture hold, it's really great pain-free, pre and post phrenectomy activity, and it is fabulous for every single thing. You can see this is me working with that, it's not completely where we're headed, but we're on the way there with getting the tongue up. and good section. It's important for the sensory input. Imagine if the tongue's not up there giving all the sensory input. Our trigeminal nerve is important for our mucosa sensory input to our mouth and the whole system of whether we can use our jaw is going to be predilected on whether we can feel what's happening with our tongue and our mouth. So here's what it is. These are um, pre phrenectomy and so don't tell me that if a baby has a tie that you can't get their tongue up because check that out, and I did, okay? Just keep working with it, pressing the tongue up underneath that point that we spoke with about the genioglossus, and keep working on it. Now, this is the maximal jaw open that this baby can get, but we'll work on that. And here's another thing you can do is, you see this baby, um, all of these, the tone, the strength, and how it looks on the face, and then the mom comes and does a really slight lift here, and look at the change in seconds and what happens in the muscle feedback, et cetera. So the signs and symptoms are gonna be some of these. Tongue's not fitting, there's pulling in the lower pharynx, we know that, that that's not working well. Laryngospasm is that uh, a lot, not just the strider and the squeakiness, but after a reflux event where they've squeezed the larynx and they don't know how to relax it to open up and let the vocal holds open. Noisy breathing of any kind, either clenched jaw or both of those. This or this. Either one, it's just not in the middle and balance because this is going to lead to this, and we know it. Okay, we all know this for a fact. This is where we're headed. This is more of a problem to take care of. So let's get together, have a multidisciplinary collaboration, and continue to grow this field. And thank you so much for your attention. And thank you.